ICAO is the um, specialized agency of the United Nations for civil aviation. It has a mandate since 1944 to set the global standards for aviation. But you're not a regulator. We are not a global regulator. We set global standards for aviation, global policies that governments follow for civil aviation. And you do it by delegates to ICAO in Montreal and by consensus. Yes. Yes, uh, the organization is based in Montreal. It has a permanent council, and it has uh, a group of experts called the Air Navigation Commission, and this system adopts the global standards for aviation. And many of you may have noted, you, you, you probably all here heard of the Warsaw Convention, the Chicago Convention, the freedoms of the air. This is all you. This is all I kill, yes. So when you heard the latest stories about the Boeing Max, both the, 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 uh, the, the, the tragic crashes and the latest door that, well, I'm not sure what it did, but it, it certainly departed the aircraft in an unintended fashion. How concerned were you? Well, we are confident that the global standards that secure that aviation is the safest mode of transportation are at work. Are at work even when things doesn't happen and it's supposed to happen. And so whenever there is an incident or worse, even an accident, then these global standards make sure that aviation continues to be the safest mode of transportation. But your organization is also the one that sets the rules for how the reports have to be done, the time scales, the searches, and all those sort of things, aren't you? Yes, yes. Right. Those are global standards that each member states follow. Yeah, um, um, I realize asking you to comment on your principal competitor would be somewhat um, unsavory. But on the question of safety, did you look at the latest Max incident and think there but for the God, grace of God, go us? It could be us next time. Yeah, um, with our competitor and with the rest of the industry, uh, we share the objective of uh, safe flights, safe mode of transportation for aviation. So that's never good when an incident is happening, whatever the, the type of plane. And uh, this incident makes us very humble. We're just uh, thinking again and again and again, what should we be doing to not be in that situation? Are we well protected from, from events? And the less accidents we see, uh, the less acceptable each and every single accident. So the, the bar is constantly being raised, and uh, that's good. That's for the safety of passengers. But related to this, and I, and I won't spend much longer on this, but related to this is the examination, which we won't do here, of what clearly went wrong at Boeing, focusing on share value, focusing on other things besides engineering and safety first, arguably. To that extent, do you look and think, do I need to tweak Airbus? Do I need to just, you know, there's a red flag being shown to us. How do I respond as a result? We're always challenging ourselves on what we do, on what we don't do, on what we should be doing differently to try to get better. And we take learnings from everywhere, from mishaps, from what's happening in other industries, uh, innovation, uh, discussion with the regulators and the trends in the industry, what's happening with digitalization and what it enables. So we're constantly reviewing, challenging, and that's also the role of the governance in a company, of the discussion that the management is having with the board and with advisory and experts outside of the, of the industry. We're in a very fast changing world. Even the weather here today in Dubai <laughs> is uh, reminding us of the, the speed of change and uh, the, the very uh, VUCA nature of the world, volatile, unpredictable, complex, ambiguous. And therefore, you need to be constantly reviewing what you're doing and challenging yourself. And I think that's one more uh, ingredient of this uh, constant challenge. Aviation has a bad rap when it comes to climate change, sustainability, everybody, right, well, let's see, <laughs> let's see. How many people, let's have a number, how many people in this room think that aviation 
contributes 20% to global emissions. Few over there. How many of you think it contributes 15% to global emissions? 14%, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, sorry? So what, what number do you think? 40%. Do I have an advance on 40%? <laughs> Sir, what's the real number? 2%. 2%. 2%. So why does, if I, nobody in this room would have said 2% except those who know. Indeed. So why are you doing such a dreadful job of getting that message across? Not just you personally, the whole industry. Guillaume, either of you. Well, 2% is uh, one gigaton. And uh, we don't like to think of 2% um, uh, is, is small or 2% is not uh, meaningful. I want to believe that we need to take those 2% or 2.5%, I think somewhere between 2 to 3% to 0% by 2050. We want to take our share, and I am absolutely convinced that aviation is a force for good for humanity, but that global warming is a reality, so we need to deal with it. And that's why with ICAO, with a lot of uh, regulators, government, and other industrial partners, we've set the goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. We have a plan and we want to go along that plan to combine the, the beauty and what uh, aviation brings to the world, but also protection of, uh, of the planet. And so we want to take care of those 2 to 3 percent. Right, but, but w we can get to the reasons how and why, but the fact is the, the industry has become the whipping boy or girl to some extent for uh, carbon and you try for, 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 for climate change because people think it's worse than it is. I believe that um, now this is changing, uh, Richard, and especially because aviation and all actors, all stakeholders, starting by uh, air aircraft manufacturers, uh, engine manufacturers, airlines, airports, air navigation service providers, and governments, are aligned in aiming at zero emissions by the year 2050. So now the story of aviation is not to try to convince how little aviation contributes on carbon emissions, but now the story is to convince that aviation is acting to achieve zero emissions by the year 2050. So how are you going to do it, Guillaume? So that's um, something quite simple, actually. Um, that we have managed to agree with the rest of the um, uh, interested parties. Uh, today, you have around 25,000 planes, commercial airplanes, that are flying around the world. Only 30% of those planes are of the latest generation. So when you replace an old generation plane by a new one, you're reducing fuel burn by 20 to 40%, depending on what generation you replace. And a lot of the backlog we have is for replacement, so that's uh, the, the first step. Second step is those planes, the one we are selling right now, are not only burning less fuel, they're also capable of 50% of sustainable aviation fuel. And that's a very important part of the answer because we're starting to go from fossil fuels to sustainable aviation fuel, and the ramp up of SAF is a very strong and important ingredient to that equation. How I, should I go to the end of the No, of the no, plan? because okay. I'm going to jump in here, if I may. How significant is SAF, sustainable aviation fuel? You'll hear us use that phrase again and again. How significant is SAF to achieving net zero? It's the pillar. It's the pillar because the technology is now available, as Guillaume was uh, just mentioning, is um, available in aircraft around the globe, and governments are now focused on aiming right. and scaling up the production and distribution availability of sustainable aviation fuels globally. Just remind us, the percentage of sustainable aviation fuel 
currently being used by airlines? Less than 1%. Less than, 1%. Less than 1% of the fuel that is being used by airlines today is made of sustainable aviation fuel. So, so, we, are, so we are just at the beginning of that transition. Right. So what do we need to do to accelerate the... Because at the moment, it's about three times more expensive, three to five times more expensive, SAF over traditional fuel. And unless you're going to pass the price... Well, it's not a question of passing the price on. You, can't get the, you cannot get the necessary... Airlines cannot get SAF in the necessary quantities, correct? Yes. Well, you need policies that incentivize the production of sustainable aviation fuels globally. You need the technologies to be more and more available. And you need the financing to scale up the production. So uh, the countries that have the feedstock to produce sustainable aviation fuels nowadays not necessarily have the technology or the means to produce it. So there lays the challenge. Just remind us what sustainable aviation fuel is made of. It's uh, made of different types of uh, um, feedstock materials or there are also chemical uh, processes that are followed in order to produce e-fuel. So there are different technological methodologies and different... Chip oil, old chip oil. Yes, yes. Uh, used uh, cook oil, for example, or um, uh, palm oil uh, in some cases, or algae, or different uh, feedstock. But you still can't get it in enough quantities, not without either government incentivizing or some form of major program that's going to both in the developing world and the developed world create enough of this at, uh, at scale. The point here, Richard, is that now the civil aviation sector is getting very serious on this, very committed. It happened here in Dubai just in November. We have the Conference on Aviation and Alternative Fuels where there was a roadmap agreed between governments, industry stakeholders, to scale up the production of SAF and uh, through SAF reduce by 5% carbon emissions in the year 2030 already. So, so you want to go from, that's 2030 from now, not 2030. So you're already, you've got to increase SAF production by how much? Probably five times, 10 times. Can you do it? So I, I think it's important to, to step back a bit on the use of SAF. Uh, when we are burning a jet fuel today, we take carbon from below the surface of the earth, and when we burn the jet fuel, we put carbon in the air. A sustainable aviation fuel is a fuel that is made of carbon coming from the air. So when you burn the SAF, you're putting the carbon back in the air, but it's neutral. Then when we go to hydrogen, we don't even put a gram of carbon in the air because there's no carbon as the result of using hydrogen. So SAF, there are many different what we call pathways to manufacture sustainable aviation fuel, but today, indeed, it's expensive. So that's why we want to continue to improve the fuel burn of planes to make the economical equation work with fuels which are more expensive. But just, just as an example, at Airbus, in 2023, 10% of the fuel we have used for, for flights, test flights, or logistic flights when we carry parts, 10% has been sustainable aviation fuel. How so much that, extra are you having to pay for that fuel? Well, that's three times more expensive. That's true. Uh, and that's the challenge that we have to, to overcome. When you buy a plane that is burning less fuel, you have economy and ecology aligned. You pursue the same objective at the same time. On sustainable aviation fuel today, it's the opposite. So an airline that is buying more sustainable aviation fuel than a competitor, is actually at a disadvantage. And so, that's what we need to change by the regulation. How do you do that? Because it, it always seems to me, and, and, and I've been covering this for a good few years, it always seems to me that all roads, Guillaume, eventually lead back to you saying government has to incentivize in some way. That's not what we're seeing. Uh, what we're saying is we expect from regulators and governments to create a frame that makes uh, the use of SAF, a level playing field. Because the problem is not that SAF is more expensive for everyone. The problem is SAF, whether you use it or not, you're at a disadvantage compared to your competitors. So we need a level playing field for more use of SAF, either through mandates, 
which is what Europe has been doing or um, what the, the CAF3 is trying to achieve, or you need to incentivize in a way that SAF and jet fuel are more or less at the same price. And then, of course, airlines would be using by far more uh, SAF, which is what's happening in the US uh, with the IRA. So there are different ways of, of doing things. The, the ability to get jet and SAF the same price can't happen. It can happen, yes. How? Scaling up the production. Who making, pays for the scaling up? That's, that's the challenge, but at the same time, the great opportunity that we see in aviation. And so, in the case of, the, of ICAO, of the International Civil Aviation Organization, we are mandated, we are focusing on how can we work with governments, and especially governments in regions that today do not produce sustainable aviation fuels, but have the feedstock, have the, the uh, advantage, competitive advantage to produce SAF to help them and support them in scaling up that production. If you have SAF available worldwide, then prices will go down. Look at what happened with uh, solar energy, for example. It took 50 years. Well, uh, in aviation, we accelerate things. So we have 20 years to do it. Hydrogen. You love hydrogen, don't you? Yes, I do. Go Why? On. Why? Yeah. Why? Uh, for the reason I mentioned before. I think uh, going from fossil fuel being used, putting carbon in the air, to SAF with a lot of complexity for sustainable aviation fuel to get the carbon out of the air, capturing carbon in quantities that are required for all fuels that we're using in aviation and in other industries will be a massive challenge. Going to hydrogen, where you don't need to capture carbon from the air. You just produce green hydrogen with green energy, so you scale up green energy, and then uh, you burn hydrogen as a fuel, or you use hydrogen in a fuel cell, which means you're just powering with electricity an electric plane. And we believe that's the ultimate um, uh, way of um, powering aviation. The only but is that it requires a lot of engineering to go from the today's form of planes we know to new forms of propulsion on aviation. And that's what Airbus is working on very seriously. We want to enter into service the first commercial uh, hydrogen plane by 2035, and we're on track to be doing this. When you say uh, hydrogen, people immediately think, of course, of the Hindenburg and uh, you know, dangerous and gases and things. It's not, is it? Well, if you would have put um, jet fuel in the, in the same uh, balloon, you might have come to the same uh, output. So it's, it's a completely different story than using a fuel as a fuel and not as a way so to... So what's the biggest complexity in going to hydrogen? Yeah. So th there are three challenges if we take a step back. One is to design, um, test and validate the technologies and do a plane. That's actually the easier part, the technology. The second one is to prepare the regulatory framework for hydrogen, uh, production, transportation, distribution, uh, to certify a plane with hydrogen technologies, there's no regulatory framework today. So that's probably a bigger challenge. And the third challenge is to have the, the green hydrogen at the airport at the right time, in the right quantity, at the right price, and so on and so on. So three challenges, okay? Then when we speak about the plane, I think that was more of your question, the technology on board the plane, you need to have liquid hydrogen, and the liquid hydrogen is at minus 253 degrees Celsius, okay? So that's a technology which we don't have today on commercial aviation, and that we're developing. But that exists on satellites, on, uh, on rockets, on launchers, uh, as well on trucks. So it's not only rocket science. That's something that can come to aviation. So with hydrogen, because I'm never quite sure when we talk about it, are we... Do you have to... I mean, I just, you know, we know it works, we just can't get it, we just haven't found a way to get it to work in this scenario. Or is it a case of we're not sure it's going to work? We still need to solve a fundamental problem to get it to work. No, we're sure it's going to work. 
you don't need to change the laws of physics to make it work. For instance, one example, the energy density of jet fuel is around 12,000 watt hours per kilogram, 12,000. A battery is 200 to 500. So you would have to change the laws of physics, <laughs> sort of, to, to power an A320 with batteries. Hydrogen is at 33,000 watt hours per kilogram. So the energy density of, uh, uh, of hydrogen is great. So, so there's nothing that is impossible to, to manage. It's just a lot of engineering, as this has not been done yet. Are you betting the bank on it? No, no, of course not. You're not? No, no, we continue to develop uh, traditional commercial aviation planes. We're preparing the next generation of single aisle, of white bodies, reducing the fuel burn, going to sustainable aviation fuel. But we will be the first one to bring a hydrogen plane uh, for a small number of passengers, smaller distances, to, to start this technology. Are you working on regulation for electric planes, hydrogen planes. In other words, are you keeping up with them as they are advancing? Are you keeping up with them so that if and when they do create this vehicle, you're able to say, right, here's your rule book for it. Regulators around the world are working with companies like Airbus and other, other innovative solutions in order to make sure that uh, the high standards of safety that are required by aviation are complied with to certify that type of products. Once we start seeing standards being adopted or products but being CAF certified, then it will become a global standard. CAF 3, the meeting that was held in Dubai, that didn't come up with anything that mandatory, did it? It's all still a bit voluntary and a bit, if you like, in the look of it. It, it is the way multilateralism work, uh, Richard. Or not? Work, in this case of aviation, if you ask uh, for aviation, for those that started in 1903, if aviation is going to be the safest mode of transportation, probably they wouldn't believe that. And today we have the safest mode of transportation to a great deal thanks to the standards that this multilateral system has brought in, into place. How do you convince people to continue flying, Guillaume, whilst all this, all this is going on and you are working towards hydrogen and you're working towards zero emissions? How do you convince people to keep flying? Or I think I'm talking to the wrong audience here because this lot will keep flying regardless. But to the next generation that says, well, it's all very environmentally unsound and uh, not good. Well, actually, that's not what we are, what we are seeing, uh, Richard. Uh, there's by far more demand than the ability to supply today. The, the need, the will to fly around the world is amazing. And even with the, with the young generation. The young generation, they are by far more conscious um, of um, global warming, climate change probably than we were. Uh, but I think they, they want to fly and they want to fly decarbonized. So they're looking at us. And, and they're putting pressure on us. And I think that's okay. It's a matter of speed, actually. I think we all agree on the fact that we'll get there, but we don't have much time. What is difficult is the speed of change, which I think is the same challenge for all industries. What we're saying about transition from um, um, carbon-intensive um, uh, fuels, uh, energy, from fossil fuels to decarbonized energy, is a challenge for all industries. We're 2 to 3% of carbon emissions, which means 97 to 98% of the carbon emissions come from the rest of the industries. But and, you're getting so much more blame. That's okay. I use it as a positive pressure because we need speed, we need energy. All right, as we come to the end here, let, your two leaders who have the potential, well, and I would say are doing, I mean, you, you, you have the potential to revolutionize the industry in your various jobs because you are controlling levers of power that will define aviation for the next 50 years. So, sir, as you look to a second term, what's going to be your barometer of success? The barometer of success is the level of progress that we achieve in this ambition to advance to a decarbonized aviation system. And for that, and I take, take advantage of this World Government Summit, to speak to government officials being here, 
ICAO is willing to support you, to offer you assistance in those efforts, from policies to technical uh, studies to um, working together with government teams in order to accelerate those efforts. And now ICAO wants to partner not only with governments, but also with financial institutions in order to accelerate SAF production. So those two things we are doing in addition to the traditional efforts we do of establishing our standards. Yeah, um, I mean, I suspect that, I don't know, but I suspect you won't be in your current job when the hydrogen plane flies. You never know. Entry into service 2035. <laughs> well, I think the board will be wise enough to find uh, someone. But what's at that your time. barometer of success now? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, we have a short term priority, which is to do the industrial ramp up of the production, because there's so much demand for the new planes, for good reasons. The one I mentioned before, they are the enablers on the short term of less fuel burn and going from jet fuel to sustainable aviation fuel. So short term, industrial ramp up. More long term, we are working very hard on bringing the new technologies for decarbonization of aviation. And that's a common challenge for the industry, for the regulators, for the governments, and as well for the users, the airlines, but as well the fuel producers. So that, that where it becomes a bit more complex is we need a full ecosystem transitioning from the today's way of doing business to the future one. Will you invite us both on your first hydrogen flight? I mean, we'll, we'll, who knows what jobs we'll be in? With pleasure, uh, Richard. We've still got to be alive by then. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.